Well, this evening, as I've said, we're going back into uh, John chapter 12. We're going to be looking at that same paragraph we were looking at this morning, and this time we're going to deal with the last two verses where Jesus applies what he was just experiencing, what he was just saying uh, to his disciples and everyone who would follow him. So let me go ahead and read that text again to begin with in John chapter 12, beginning in verse 20 through verse 26. Now there were some Greeks among those who were going up to worship at the feast. These then came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida of Galilee, and began to ask him, saying, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip came and told Andrew. Andrew and Philip came and told Jesus. And Jesus answered them, saying, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. He who loves his life loses it. And he who hates his life in this world will keep it to life eternal. If anyone serves me, he must follow me. And where I am, there my servant will be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. Uh, may the Lord again bless his word to our hearing this evening. Now, you know from the text I just read that this is one of those texts that's very searching, challenging, and um, reminds us, I think, rather point blank of what life is all about, what it is we need to be aiming at, and what it is we need to cut off out of our lives. So let's go ahead and look at it. Now, remember this morning, we saw, as I've just read, some God-fearing Gentiles that had come to the Passover feast uh, to worship. They had heard about Jesus, that he had raised a dead man from the grave, that he had been hailed as the Messiah and basically uh, you know, worshipped as he entered into Jerusalem. Uh, and they wanted to see him. They were interested in him. They wanted to learn more about him. Uh, they showed every indication, as we saw this morning, the Spirit of God was drawing them to Jesus. It's always something that is wonderful to see. And the Lord will do that. He will draw people to Jesus if we will tell them about Jesus. As long as they're ignorant of him, they will not come to him. Now, we also saw that Jesus was interested in these Greeks, uh, even though he wasn't yet in a position to entertain them at that particular moment. But he knew that their interest in him was an indication of his glorification, that it was drawing near, that it was time for him to lay down his, his life, that he might be the means of saving many, not only from among the Jews, but again, as the example of these God-fearing Gentiles showed him also from among the nations. Now this evening, we want to consider that what Jesus was about to do, what it is he said this morning, as we just saw and reminded he was about to do, uh, that is die so that others may live, also applied to those Gentiles that were interested in him if they were to follow him. That it also applied to his disciples since they were already following him and that it also applies to us since the Lord calls us to follow him. Uh, when Jesus said in verse 24, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone, but if it dies, it bears much fruit. He was not only referring to himself, he was also referring to everyone who would ever come after him. This is what is required of them. If they are to bear fruit, if they are to follow him, if they are to see heaven, and if they are to bear fruit... Now, Jesus had to die on the cross, as we saw. He had to take the curse of the broken covenant of works upon himself in order to save many people, in order to save us. But in a very real sense, we know that Jesus had already been dying his entire life, in, in a certain sense. He was continually denying himself in order that he might serve others, in order that he might serve us, in order that he might save us. Jesus now says that what he did for us, he wants us to do 
for others. And this shouldn't come as a great surprise because Jesus calls us to imitate his example in absolutely everything. So this evening, let's consider what Jesus is telling us, that we also must die if we are to bear fruit. Actually, we also have to die if we are to enter into heaven. So the first thing I want us to look at is this. Jesus tells us that we must deny ourselves in this life. We must hate this life, he says, if we are to see heaven. Another way of putting it is we must deny ourselves if heaven belongs to us. I think sometimes <clears throat> we can look at this text and get the wrong idea that Jesus is basically giving us a blueprint, a series of, of steps to follow in order to make it into heaven. But, but that isn't essentially correct. It is at one level. We must do this. But it isn't in another, at another level. It's not something that we have to do by our own strength in order to enter into heaven, but something the Lord does within us if we have truly trusted him, something that is an ongoing work and it will go on our entire lives. But this is what he says in verse 25. He who loves his life loses it, and he who hates his life in this world will keep it to eternal life. Now notice that particular verse divides all people into two groups. There are those who love their lives and those who hate their lives. There are those who are going to lose their lives and those who are going to keep their lives. Those who are going to go to hell and those who are going to enter into heaven. Jesus tells us what the difference is between them. Now what he's telling is us is this, that we can't love our lives in this world. We can't live like those who live in this world who do not know God, who are his enemies. We cannot live like them and expect in the end to enter into heaven. We must be willing to give up our lives here to gain that life which is to come. Now, as we've already seen, <clears throat> Jesus was speaking as much to himself as he was to his disciples and even to these God-fearers that wanted to see him. When he said in verse 24, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. Basically, he's talking about the same thing here <clears throat> in these particular verses. There is a price that we must be willing to pay if we are to serve the Lord. And this isn't the first time Jesus said this. I mean, he said what we saw in, the, um, in our meditation, Caesarea Philippi, telling his disciples what it is they must be willing to pay. There were those who came to him early on in his ministry. And we read in Matthew chapter 8 in verses 19 through 20. Then a scribe came and said to him, Teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus said to him, The foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Jesus is basically challenging him. Do you really want to follow me? If you do, you need to realize the accommodations aren't going to be quite so lavish. I don't really even have any place to call my own. I don't have any place to put my head. That's the way it's going to be with you. Is that what you want? Are you willing to accept this? Are you willing to endure whatever you must endure to follow me? Well, if the answer is yes, well, then come along. But if it isn't, then you can't be my disciple. He said to the crowds on another occasion who were following him in Luke 14, verses 26 through 27. And these are pretty severe words. Um, and again, I think follow along quite well what we're looking at this evening. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not carry his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. And again, remember what Jesus is saying here. He's not saying, you know, you can't be my disciple now at this time and follow me throughout Galilee in my ministry. But what he's saying is from this time on, disciples, you know, their disciples were first called Christians at Antioch. Disciples are Christians. You can't be a Christian unless you're willing to do this. You can't go to heaven unless you're willing to do this. You can't uh, enter into life, Jesus says, unless you hate your life in this world. So Jesus is saying to this crowd, do you really want to be my disciples? 
To be my disciples, you have to love me, most of all. You have to love me more than your parents, more than your spouse, more than your brothers or sisters, more than your children. If there's a conflict between what it is they want you to do and what I want you to do, you must choose what I want you to do. If you want to do one thing and, and uh, I want you to do another, you must be willing to do what I want you to do. Now, understanding that's the case, do you still want to be my disciples? Now, again, we do need to understand that Jesus is not telling us that if we are to follow him, that we have to have some kind of a death wish, that we have to want to, to physically die or that we can't be concerned about our own health or well-being, or that we can't get any kind of rest, because not to do these things would be to break the sixth commandment. We have to take care of ourselves. Jesus was never careless with his life, nor did he ever put his life on the line needlessly. He made sure he kept all the commandments at all time. By the way, the thought occurs to me as I think about that. Uh, what does that say about those types of sports that put our lives needlessly on the line? We need to protect our lives. Jesus is not saying have a death wish. Jesus is also not telling us that we can't enjoy anything in this world that is good and enjoyable like good food or recreations or going on vacations as long as, again, the, the, you know, we're not... Uh, doing things we shouldn't be doing with that food, like being gluttons, over-recreating and becoming sluggards and lazy, um, as long as we're not doing things in our vacation and our recreations which are sinful in and of themselves because those things, of course, are always wrong, but things that will actually refresh us, things that will actually help us. Uh, Jesus, we know, often had to get away from the crowds to pray, to rest, refresh himself, to regain his strength so that he might minister to others. But there are things that Jesus is telling us here that we must not do. First of all, he's telling us that we must not love the world or the things that are in the world. And again, John tells us what that means in 1 John 2.16. He says, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the boastful pride of life, is not from the Father, but is from the world. These are the things that Satan puts into the world to ensnare us, to draw us away from him, to draw us into the world and away from God. These don't come from the Father. These come from the enemy. Those are the things we must not love. We actually have to hate these things. John writes further in verse 15, if anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. These two loves are mutually exclusive. You cannot love one and the other. We came into this world loving the world. The Spirit of God put the love of the Father in our hearts. It broke that love of the world and started moving us toward the Father. And if we have that love, we will not love the things of the world. We'll still struggle with it, like, like everything else, like all other sins. But we will not love it and give ourselves to it in the way that we would have before or the way the people of the world do today. We cannot follow their example. We cannot be like Jesus' enemies and expect to be received as his friends in the end. So we can't love the things of the world. He's also telling us we can't even love the good things that he has given us in this world more than we should love them. I already talked about, you know, the, we can love food too much. We can love... Uh, wine too much, we can love money too much, we can love our spouses too much, we can love our children too much. Uh, even good things can be loved too much and our Lord tells us that our love for Him is to be so great that our love for our closest loved ones by comparison should be something more like hatred. If we love anything more than we love Him, that is an idol. It becomes our God. And God tells us he is a jealous God and he must be first in our hearts. Jesus says we must not love our lives. We must hate our lives. We must hate this world. And even, even those good things in the world, again, you recall Bunyan and Pilgrim's Progress, Vanity Fair. There were things there in the world that were sinful, 
that could ensnare the pilgrims, but there were things that were good there, too, that could also ensnare them, and they had to watch out for both of them, and so must we. Jesus is telling us that if we are to follow him, if we are to see heaven, if we have the Spirit of God in us, that we cannot and we will not put our own desires in front of his desires. That's what he means when he says we need to pick up our crosses. We must die to what we want and do what he wants. By the way, we have the Spirit of God in us. We will have a desire to do what he wants. And so we will yield to that and cross our other desires. What does it mean to be a servant? What does it mean to have a master? It means that I sacrifice my will for his and I submit to him and I serve him. Jesus says that is what we must have. We must die to ourselves if we are to bear fruit, but we must also do this if we are to enter into heaven. And Jesus means by this that we also must be willing even to die for his cause if that's what he calls us to do. In other words, we must carry with us the heart of a martyr. We must be willing to lay down our lives for the Lord Jesus Christ. Now Paul certainly had that attitude and every true believer does. He said to the Ephesian elders in Acts 20 verse 24, but I do not consider my life of any account as dear to myself so that I may finish my course in the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus to testify solemnly of the gospel of the grace of God. I don't consider my life, he says, of any account as dear to myself. What's important to me is that I do what Jesus called me to do. He said to the believers at Caesarea, when he tried to uh, talk him out of going to Jerusalem, because Agabus had just said, you know, the person who owns this belt is going to be bound and arrested, in Jerusalem and imprisoned and so forth. They tried to stop him. Paul, don't go up to Jerusalem. Well, this is what Paul says in Acts 21, verse 13. What are you doing? Weeping and breaking my heart. For I am ready not only to be bound, but even to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. Now you see, Jesus was about to lay down his life for what his father had called him to do. He was willingly going to yield it up. Paul was willing to do exactly the same thing, to die in order that he might carry out the ministry that the, the Lord had given to him. Jesus says that is what we must be willing to do as well. So if we put ourselves and the good things of the world ahead of him, if we love our lives here and we do what we want to do rather than what the Lord calls us to do, in essence, we are showing that we really do not at least yet know him. And of course, if we die in that condition, we will lose our lives. We will not enter into heaven. But if we let go of these things, which we have, if we have trusted the Lord Jesus, if we see the world for what it is, an enemy of God, contrary to his will, if we turn from it and lay down our lives and pick up our crosses, we show that we do know him. Jesus says we will not only keep our lives here, which means not only will the Lord preserve us here, as we just saw in Psalm 23, the Lord being our shepherd, watching over us, making sure we'll get to heaven, but when we are finished here, we will enter into heaven. So basically what our Lord is telling us here is, is something that divides, as I've said, all mankind into two groups, those who are saved and those who are not. What is the difference? He who loves his life in this world loses it. And he who hates his life in this world will keep it to life eternal. Now Jesus goes on to describe what this laying down of our lives really looks like, what it means to hate our lives in this world. What it looks like is his life. He says in verse 26, if anyone serves me, he must follow me. Again, not just when he was there on earth to sort of imitate or to walk behind as he's going down the road from city to city preaching, but he means follow his example. Well, that's a pretty tough act to follow, but the Lord tells us when he gives us his Holy Spirit, he gives us the ability to do that, not perfectly, but in some measure. Now, what is Jesus calling us to do? 
He's calling us to do what he did. But again, consistent with where we're at, um, you know, where we, where we live in our culture, society, whether male or female, how old we are, what authority we're under, what, what he's called us to do is vocation. If Jesus were living our life, that is how we should live as we believe he would live, as we, of course, understand his character. Now, again, I believe that's what he says in verse 24. Again, this refrain, truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. What does it mean to die so that we may bear fruit? Well, it means to follow the example of our Lord Jesus Christ. It means, first of all, to die to this world, as we just saw. But secondly, it means to follow the example that Jesus has given. So what is the example that he's given? Well, take a long time to explain everything here, but let's just look at a few things. Jesus definitely had a purpose in his life. And his purpose was one purpose, a singular purpose, to advance his Father's glory, to advance his kingdom. That is what Jesus was like. He had a particular way of achieving that goal obedience to his father's commands. He never did anything outside of what the father called him to do. As we already said, he had a single purpose, a single mind and a single heart. He always went where his father called him to go. He always did what his father called him to do. He always suffered whatever the father called him to suffer. He was willing to do whatever he had to do in order to glorify God. Jesus also had a godly character. When he was doing what he was doing, he didn't do it grudgingly. He, he didn't you know, act as though he was fighting against himself to do it because his heart was singular. He wanted to do it. He loved his father with all of his heart. He loved his neighbor as he loved himself. He was patient with all men. And he humbled himself to become the servant of all. So what does it mean to die? What does it mean to hate our lives here? What does it mean to follow the Lord Jesus Christ? Well, we have to do the same thing that Jesus did. We need to live to advance his cause. We need to do so in the way that he calls us to do and not in the way that we might choose. We have to do it according to the will of God, according to the word of God. We have to be willing to do whatever the Lord calls us to do whenever the Lord calls us to do it, no matter how much we might have to suffer for it. And we need to do it in love, in patience, and in humility. Now again, the good news is this. I mean, this sounds like a really tall order, and it is, in a certain level, it is impossible. We cannot do it by ourselves. But if we have trusted Jesus and are by his grace on the way to heaven, he has already given us the ability to do these things by his Holy Spirit. That principle of the Spirit within our souls, that love for God and everything good and right is that which we need and we have. And so we can do this. As we've been exhorted on many occasions through the scriptures, we simply need to cultivate the fruit of the Spirit of God by seeking to be filled with the Spirit and as Stuart Elliott reminded us, when we are filled with the Spirit, the Spirit of God is going to be moving us in the direction that God is calling us in His Word. We just simply need to yield to it. It's a lot easier to be moved in that way than to have, as it were, the the threats of judgment chasing behind you, forcing you forward against your will to do something you really don't want to do. Well, that's the way it is with those who love their lives in this world, those who really don't know the Lord Jesus Christ. They're being forced or feel like they're being forced to do that. And in certain senses, our sin within us makes us feel like that sometimes as well. But when we have the Spirit of God within us, He is giving us the desire for this and the power to do this which is in that desire. And we just simply need to yield to Him and follow Him as He leads us yield to that desire and cross and put to death the other desire that is in us not to do what the Lord is calling us to do. Now, finally, we do need to understand that the Lord is not calling us to give up this world and to make all these sacrifices for nothing. Uh, 
there's a great reward that's involved here. The, he puts out this glorious light at the end of the tunnel. He says, if we hate our lives here, if we serve him and we follow him here, that he will reward us. He says in verse 26, and where I am, there my servant will be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. Well, I guess the question is, do you want to be where Jesus is? And do you want the honor that comes from the Father? If you do, that is an extremely uh, desirable carrot that the Lord is holding out in, in front of, of you, in front of me, in front of each one of us. Now Jesus says here, first of all, if we will serve and follow him, we will be where he is. And where is Jesus? I mean, Jesus is in heaven. If we serve him here, if we follow him here, if we die to ourselves here and pick up our crosses and follow him, we will be with him there. Jesus says in John 14, verses 1 through 3, to his disciples, we haven't gotten to this part yet in the upper room discourse. We're going to get to that, I believe, beginning in chapter 13. But Jesus says in chapter 14, verses 1 through 3, Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. For I go to prepare a place for you. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. And receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Jesus will, at the conclusion of the, actually, of the Upper Room Discourse, and as he moves, as it were, into the uh, Garden of Gethsemane, as he prays the, well, the prayer, what we call the High Priestly Prayer. I can't remember really offhand if that takes place in Gethsemane or not, but the, he prays this in John 17, verse 24. He says, Father, I desire that they also, whom you have given me, be with me where I am, so that they may see my glory which you have given me, for you loved me before the foundation of the world. Now it's interesting the way that Jesus puts this, because he puts it in each of these texts in the same way. In, in our passage this evening and in the last two passages, Jesus refers to himself as being in heaven already. I don't know if you plan to put these on the, on the screen or not, but in John 12, 26 in our text, he says, if anyone serves me, he must follow me, and where I am, there my servant will be also. He says in John 14, I think it was in verse 3, if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And then in verse, chapter 17, verse 24, Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me be with me where I am. Now Jesus could mean several things by this. He could mean, you know, wherever I happen to be at any given time, my servants will always be with me. So where I am, there they will be. Well, if, if that were the case, then when Jesus was on the cross, he's saying where I am, I pray my disciples will be with me as well on crosses beside me. Well, we know that didn't happen. But what Jesus is referring to in each of these instances, of course, is, is heaven. So what did he mean? Well, he either meant that his divine nature was in heaven uh, as he was on the earth and that human nature, his divine nature was everywhere. So he was just as much in heaven as he had always been in heaven. Where I am, Father, I pray that my disciples may be with me as well. Or he could be referring to the fact that his going to heaven was so certain that as far as he was concerned, he was already there. You know, we've seen instances in Scripture where that actually takes place, where those who are united with Jesus Christ are so certain to be in heaven with him that Paul says to the Ephesians, you are already seated with Christ in the heavenly places. But whatever Jesus may have meant, the point is certainly this, that as certain as Jesus is there or will be there, so we will be there if we leave this world behind if we follow him. And we do need to understand that that world is a much better world than the world in which we are living. Now we can, you know, sort of blind ourselves to all the things going on in this world and we can focus on the few little things that we really like in this world and we may say, it's really not that bad a place. 
But if you read the news, if you're plugged into the news, you know, if you're looking at what's going on, all the murdering, all the, all the perversions that, that are going on, you, if you love righteousness, if you, if you know what the Lord loves, those things as, as they did to Lot when he was living in Sodom, uh, torment you. This is not a good place to live. That world is much, much better place. Some have said this is the closest that any Christian is ever going to get to hell. That's what this world is like compared to heaven. Jesus is telling us that if we will hate this world, if we will deny ourselves, if we will die, as he calls us to die, then we will be able to go to this world which is so much better. Matthew Henry put it in this way. He weans us from this world by showing us another and better world. That's the reason why the Lord tells us essentially what heaven is like so that we'll want to be there. Why he gives us a desire for it by his Holy Spirit. That desire to be in heaven makes us want to leave here. Which is why the Apostle Paul said on one occasion, at least in writing to the Philippians, to depart and to be with Christ is so much better than remaining here. But that's God's plans, his will. So remaining here, I'm still going to serve him, still going to love him, but I know I'm on my way to a much, much better place well that is what Jesus says he will give us if we are willing to die for him but there's more uh, we will not only be where he is in heaven he says we will also receive a reward he says in verse 26 if anyone serves me the father will honor him now again let me just draw your attention to what Jesus said earlier in John 12 verse 24 Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. If we hate our lives here, if we follow Jesus, if we follow him by dying to ourselves like this grain of wheat that falls into the earth and dies, we will bear much fruit. And we can't bear fruit unless we actually die. If we don't die, we'll remain alone, like Jesus said of himself this morning. But if we die, we will bear fruit, because if we die to ourselves in the way that Jesus is calling us to, then we can know that we are abiding in the Lord Jesus Christ, and our Lord tells us that if we abide in him, we will bear much fruit. In John 15, verse 5, Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. So if we die, we'll, we'll show that we're abiding in Christ. If we're abiding in Christ, we will bear much fruit. And if we bear much fruit, we will receive a reward. I mean, the Lord, again, does not have us serve him for nothing. Heaven certainly is a reward. But heaven is the reward that Jesus deserves and the one he gives to us freely and that we receive by faith. We don't have to work for that. We don't get there by our works. But the honor that the Father will show us on that day of his judgment is what we deserve, and I'm going to put that in, in quotation marks, by the works that we do while we are here, by the fruit that we bear, by his grace. Now we understand that nothing we do here on earth really deserves a reward. But the Lord rewards it when it is cleansed through the mediation of our Lord Jesus Christ. Everything we offer to the Lord through the Lord Jesus Christ, he receives. Because Jesus is able to take away those impurities and the Lord says he will reward us for all those things we do for him in this life. And so as Jesus died to himself and gave himself to serve his father, in doing so bore a great deal of fruit and received a tremendous reward. If we follow his example and we die to ourselves, we also will bear much fruit and we will also receive a reward. And that reward will be consistent with what it is we actually do for the Lord in this world. Now, in closing, let's just simply apply that in, in, one, uh, in one area, and that is to what the Lord has given us to do. 
uh, as his church in this world. How can we do a better job? How can we do a better job of what the Lord has given us to do in the Great Commission or in evangelism? How can we better do what our Lord Jesus Christ actually did? If we're going to follow his example, this is what we need to be doing. How can we advance the kingdom of heaven? Well, the only way we can do it is to do it in the way that Jesus just told us. If, if the grain of wheat doesn't die, if it doesn't go into the earth, it remains by itself. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. The only way that we can advance the kingdom of heaven is by hating our lives here, dying to ourselves here, picking up our crosses, and following the Lord Jesus Christ. If, if we don't do that, I mean, Jesus has already told us if we don't do that, we don't know him. We're not going to see heaven. If we do this, we do know him. We are going to see heaven. But to the degree that we do this, to that degree, we're not only going to be rewarded, but to that degree, we are going to bear fruit and advance the kingdom of heaven. So dying to ourselves, freeing ourselves from the things that take us away from the Lord, that distract us, is key to doing what the Lord called us to do. If we want to bear a lot of fruit, much fruit, we must die to ourselves. We must hate this world. We must follow the example of our Lord Jesus Christ who died to himself and gave himself to the Father's exclusive use, had that one goal, that one purpose in mind, and continually pursued it. I think we'll find as we look at Horatius Bonner and, and his chapter on the men God uses in revival, we're going to find that they shared those same characteristics. So in short, I think we must do what the Apostle Paul exhorted the Colossians. Again, Jesus wasn't the only one who said that we had to do these things. Uh, those who followed him did it, and of course they encouraged those they ministered to to do it as well. Let me just read this in closing. Colossians 3, verses 1 through 4. Paul wrote, Therefore, if you have been raised up with Christ, and of course if you've been raised up, that means you died with him, keep seeking the things above where Christ is. Seated at the right hand of God, set your mind on the things above, not on the things that are on earth, for you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. If you've died and been raised, seek the things above. Set your mind on the things above, not on the things of earth. And notice, when Christ is revealed, you will be revealed with him also in glory. That is, you will be with him in glory. Where my servant is, Jesus said, uh, where I am, there my servant will also be. Let's, let's bow in a few moments of silent prayer and let's ask the Lord to help us receive this message and to do what it is he's, he calls us to do and what he has given us the power to do through his gospel.